ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paul Mason. Welcome to the show, Paul. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. How the hell are you? I'm excellent, thanks, Slavin. It's, uh, yeah, I've just uh, had a nice day at work, had a nice dinner, and uh, now I'm just kicking back chatting to you. Well, it's an absolute delight to have you on the show. And I, the first burning question I have for you is, what did you have for dinner? What did I have for dinner? Well, tonight it was uh, Swedish meatballs. Are they from Ikea, by any chance? No, they weren't. But uh, we live near Ikea. Uh, it's actually, to be honest, they're not Swedish meatballs, but they're meatballs that we brand as Swedish for the purposes of uh, getting our kids to eat them. <laughs> what makes a meatball Swedish? I think it's a little flag. <laughs> Which you do not want to get on the roof of your mouth because that would hurt like a bitch. Uh, no, yeah. So you've you got to stick a little flag in each of them. That, that identifies it. Paul, you're, uh, you're a, a very interesting individual to me. And I know that our audience will find you interesting as well. If they don't know you, maybe could you share a little bit about your background and, and what you're doing these days for us, please. Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a medical doctor. I've, I'm a sports medicine and exercise physician. So I've sort of got a bit of an interest in work life. I sort of spend a bit of time uh, treating metabolic disease. A large proportion of my time in clinic is uh, metabolic health, diabetics, helping people with weight loss and uh, autoimmune diseases, so on and so forth. I see a proportion of athletes, so ranging from the uh, recreational 5k runner up to uh, Olympic level athletes and we just generally see a lot of bunch of people with uh, musculoskeletal aches and pains. So I tend to have a few interests. I'm um, probably like yourself. My attention span is sometimes a wee bit short. So I've uh, interests will include uh, spinal pain, tendon pain, you know, as well as metabolic stuff. And I spend a bit of time as a surgical assistant in theater, usually about one day a week in theatres. So I've got a pretty good work-life balance and that variety will hopefully keep me happy for at least the next couple of years before I get too bored. Well, how did you end up being interested in the areas that you're interested in now, Paul? I think there's a uh, chance always has a lot to play with it. I think I've got a contrarian instinct or a, a questioning, uh, some people might say cynical, um, instinct, uh, just looking at things and questioning whether that can be the way it is or not. I mean, I, I was a pretty typical medical student. I finished medical school and uh, I'd sort of, you know, pretty well swallowed hook, line and sinker. The whole um, lipid heart hypothesis that eating saturated fat will raise your cholesterol and you'll die of a heart attack. You ought not do that, you know, but sugar is okay because, hey, there's no fat in sugar. Um, and then I, I read some uh, literature. I just came across an editorial one day and it was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and it was by a couple of guys who are absolutely really in respect. So Professor Peter Bruckner and Professor Tim Noakes and they're no slouches in the, in the world of sports science. And if you understand that world at all, you'll know their names are held in the highest of regard. And they had this ridiculous editorial talking about how diabetes was nothing to do with fat and it was all to do with sugar and you could actually treat it and manage it and all of this. And it was a bit rubbish, but I looked at some of the references and what they were saying st stacked up. I'm like, and I'm not normally that reactionary. I I'm not normally quite that impulsive, but I think pretty much that evening I made the decision, well, I might just give this a crack. And, you know, that was about the time there was, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, Robert Lustig's talk on YouTube came out, Sugar the Bitter Truth. That's had over 10 million views now. And that details uh, intensely all the biochemistry of how fructose uh, can, you know, cause metabolic dysregulation, so on and so forth. So there was just multiple pieces of information coming in. And myself, I was, I was young, I was fit. You know, I was, um, I was exercising hours and hours a week, but you know, my, you know, technically I had metabolic syndrome. I wasn't overweight, but I had dyslipidemia and, you know, had the, uh, enough other features to tick the boxes for metabolic syndrome. So like pre-diabetic state or you were diabetic? No, no, no. So metabolic syndrome, there's just five markers relating to triglycerides and HDL, abdominal adiposity, blood pressure, and you know, this 
um, if you tick three of those and you know arbitrarily you're defined as having metabolic syndrome so just qu very quickly what are they what are those five ones just very quickly for the the listener so so elevated blood sugar levels um, hypertension or elevated blood pressure um, triglycerides hdl and uh, what's the other one what have i not said hdl triglycerides blood pressure uh blood so glucose uh look i it depends on the definition so it's a moving target so uh, and depending on the population some uh some people say the pop you know you you should change the level of blood sugar depending on the population in much the same way that we have different abdominal circumferences um, for populations depending on your ethnicity um, but you know, I really don't think that's um, uh, yeah it, it doesn't really you know matter you know as long as you know if it's clearly higher it's clearly low you can have the mid-range but interestingly if we are using the the um, symptoms of metabolic syndrome there was a national survey in the United States recently that found that only 12% of Americans over the age of 20 are metabolically healthy, but so uh, I was uh, so I was in that uh, that 88 percent who wouldn't have been considered metabolically healthy. So I ended up giving the diet a crack myself, and I had stonking results. Um, and I guess uh, over time, I've uh, from personal results and you know I've literally thousands of hours of research and reading on the topic. I now apply it with my patients who also have magnificent results, used it in athletes with excellent results. Um, it, it's sort of, it's just one of those things. It's so applicable to, to every aspect of health we look at. And so I can see patients, they might have a metabolic issue. They might have a musculoskeletal issue. It can be diabetes. It can be for knee arthritis. It can be for autoimmune disease. There's, dietary elements that can improve basically all markers of chronic disease, um, which makes sense really, because chronic diseases are an aberrance of modern lifestyle. So is, this is a potentially a sweeping generalization with all the work that you do with regards to muscle pain, back pain, uh, a lot of these inflammatory type responses, are they almost all related to the food that goes in our stomachs? I wouldn't say they're related, but you'd say there there is connections. And you'd say that a bad diet can make most anything else worse. So if we took something like back pain, um, then th there's obvious, you know, there's different problems with discs and joints and so on and so forth. But if you're 50 kilograms overweight, that's going to be a contributor. And if you lose some of that weight, that's going to make things better. With um, joint pain, osteoarthritis, it gets really quite interesting because traditionally we say that if you can lose 10% of your body weight, then your arthritis pain will reduce by 30 to 50%. And that's a very well accepted number, which then brings the obvious paradox is that if we say that you reduce your body weight, that's reducing the mechanical loading on joints. Shouldn't the reduction in pain therefore be more proportional to the amount of weight you lose? So what we actually find, and, and this is where one of the nascent areas of science, which is quite exciting, is that all metabolic disease, there's two main things involved, one mitochondria and two the liver. And the liver produces this enzyme that actually helps break down the protective layer on the end of your bones. And the liver produces that more when it's sick and under stress and unhealthy. And when you lose weight, that first 10% of body weight you lose, well, a lot of that first 10% comes away from your organs. It's what we call this visceral fat or hepatic or liver fat. So even though you might still be significantly overweight, the fact that you can lose 10 kilograms usually means your liver is a heck of a lot healthier and you have much less or much lower levels of this enzyme that's going around um, degrading the protective layer on the end of your bones, what we call the articular cartilage. So that actually explains why 10% weight loss can lead to 50% pain reduction in osteoarthritis. And 
you know, we can have a look at other conditions as well. If you have a look at autoimmune conditions where the immune system, you know, it's a horrible condition. Your body's attacking itself. You know, basically you've got your immune system that's meant to protect you against pathogens. And basically it goes rogue and it starts identifying your own cells as foreign pathogens and having a crack at them. And if we have a look at a condition like uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's the most common autoimmune disease. So you've got your thyroid gland just in the base of your neck here. Imagine your immune system's having a, a crack at that, just plucking off all the, you know, progressively attacking the thyroid cells. Well, now there's evidence that by going on a gluten-free diet, these levels of these antibodies that we measure in the blood actually falls, reduces. Um, if we have a look at another condition, type one diabetes, which is autoimmune diabetes, basically um, young people, uh, and this is a, a, a sweeping generalization, but in general, we tend to think about it in young people. They have an autoimmune attack that's uh, targeting a particular type of cell in their pancreas that secretes insulin. So they can't secrete insulin. If you wanted to increase the chance, if you're a, a pregnant lady, if you wanted to increase the chances of your offspring having type one diabetes, you would eat more gluten. If you wanted to reduce the risk of it, you would eat less gluten. And we've got very, very strong evidence for this. So it doesn't really, you know, you can look at almost any aspect of chronic health and you'll find a nutritional link to it. We have a look at Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's, it's considered to be a genetic disease. Um, well, you know what? There's, if you have a bad diet, then having bad genetics, and when I say bad genetics, I, I use the term loosely because there is the, the genetic allele that increases your risk factor for Alzheimer's is actually quite beneficial in some other respects. Um, there's been a lot of associational data indicating it's associated with improved immune function and imp higher intelligence. Wow. Um, but if you have this, uh, what we call the ApoE4 allele, and your metabolic is unhealthy, then you're shit out of luck, basically. But if you are metabolically healthy, then having the ApoE4 allele really doesn't really confer that elevated risk that everybody's worried about. So it's true what they're saying is that Alzheimer's disease is indeed type three diabetes. And then there's a the big one, which a lot of people are very, very scared. And you, when I say the big one, you probably know where I'm going. Um, it's the big C word, cancer. And we know that obesity is independently associated with increased risk of at least 13 different types of cancers. So I, I, can, I can comfortably say if you're metabolically healthy, then you have less risk of cancer. But the interesting thing for me is that our, the paradigm of what causes cancer is now under challenge. And it's under challenge by a lot of articles that have now been published in the peer reviewed medical literature. So the existing paradigm is that cancer is a genetic disease. And that if you just happen to have the, the wrong genetics, presumably you pick the wrong parents, then you're a sitting duck for cancer. There's nothing really that you can do. And this actually defies any logical thought process because we'll have to ask, well, are we that genetically different to what we were in the 1800s? Well, no. Then why are cancer rates skyrocketing if, it, if it's a genetic condition? It really shouldn't be increasing that quickly. So if you understand that um, there, there is genetic damage in cancer, that's absolutely so. If we look at the nucleus of a cancer cell, we, you've got this little thing of it like a ball delve into the inside, you pull out the nucleus, which is where all the DNA is. You have a look at that, there's a lot of damage there. But the question is, chicken or the egg, did the DNA damage cause the cancer or did the cancer cause the DNA damage? Because there's an increasing school of thought that cancer is actually a metabolic disease residing in the power plants of the cell called the mitochondria. And if they're not working properly, they generate something called reactive oxygen species, basically oxidation stress. And they create something called a free radical, which can then bounce around inside the cell and can land onto this DNA and damage the DNA. So if you follow this theory, then it, it logically follows that the cancer, the de genetic damage we're seeing is a downstream product of the mitochondrial damage. So they've done these studies 
So they've got a cancerous cell and a healthy cell. So they take out the nucleus with all the genetic information. Now, and then they implant that damaged DNA into a healthy cell. Now, if cancer was a genetic disease, what should happen? Nothing. Well, if it's a genetic disease and you've put bad, bad genes, damaged genes into a healthy cell, you should transfer the cancer. Yeah, the opposite. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see where you're going with this. But it doesn't. If you then take the fluid outside the, the genes, the fluid that contains the mitochondria, and you put that into a healthy cell, you don't put any genetic information in, no, well, not genetic information in terms of the nucleus, just the mitochondria, then what happens? That cell you transplant it to is stuffed. You've nuggeted it. So this kind of experiment, and there's, there's a whole lot more lines of data that would indicate that our existing paradigm of cancer, our premise that it's genetic damage initially that initiates the process is wrong. That the genetic damage is actually a secondary effect to metabolic disturbance of the mitochondria. And that would then explain why we've got at least 13 different types of cancer that are independently associated with this. And then you might have some listeners who are actually pretty switched on. They might be medical people and say, well, you've got some kind of cancers um, that are caused by infections. Human papilloma virus causing cervical cancer. Yeah, true. Do you know what human papilloma virus does to a cell? It damages the mitochondria. So these, these cancers, what about smoking induced lung cancer? Mitochondrial damage. Wow. So it, it's a common pathway. So it doesn't mean that all the cancers are caused by nutrition, but it means that the mitochondria are most likely involved in most all cancers and nutrition has got a huge role in causing mitochondrial dysregulation. Wow. So if you are eating the wrong stuff and you've got a combination of some genetic predisposition, you are basically a sitting, sitting duck. And even if you're not, you just, you don't know when, when any of that mitochondrial damage can take place and then trigger something that you didn't even know you, you could potentially get. I was reading some data today about the uh, native American Indians um, before, you know, Europeans, you know, came and did what they did. And in the traditional native tribes, their rate of centenarians was, you know, something like, you know, 80 times more than in the equivalent white society. So wow. you have to ask yourself, so, you know, th this is a massive number. So, you know, people living to be a hundred in, you know, in a society supposedly without, you know, advanced medical care, so on and so forth, living a heck of a lot longer than white society. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of lifestyle factors there. And if we actually, you know, we're, you know, and it's not necessarily that long ago, but it was just whether they were in their traditional lifestyles or not. Um, and wherever you, if you have a look at the uh, accounts of some of the early explorers looking at the native tribes of Africa and different places around the world, almost to a man, they, these were people who were very well um, skilled. There's doctors who were well skilled and educated in diagnosing cancers and heart disease and stuff like that in their own countries before they, they went offshore. Um, so it wasn't that they were incapable of diagnosing these conditions. It's just that these conditions weren't there to be found. They, they couldn't, you know, a lot of cases, they were looking for cancer, they couldn't find it. A lot of cases they were looking for heart disease, they couldn't find it. So early on, they, so with the Maasai, they did, you know, something like one study, maybe 400 ECGs from memory, didn't find any problems. They did autopsies on a hundred other native tribes people, and they found two cases that may have had evidence of having a heart attack, but they weren't really sure. I mean, these chronic diseases that, you know, we almost consider normal now were actually really rare in antiquity with healthy lifestyles, healthy diets. They, you know, we've, uh, we've really have a distorted perspective of what it takes to be healthy now because the average person is unhealthy. 
So, Dr. Paul, what, what the fuck do we do about it? Well, you know, we, I guess it depends on, you know, at what level you're talking about. Are you talking about as an individual? Are you, are you talking about as a, as a medical profession? Are you talking about as a government approach? Because it's, the trouble is we've been, the science has been misrepresented. Let's, let's assume a hypothetical situation here, Paul. Let's go, you have been elected Prime Minister of Australia and you had, a, a, like, you, you were able to be a dictator and, and determine exactly what was said. And what would you do? What would you do given the current state of the population, the current state of the medical situations that we have, and you've got full authoritarian <laughs> rights? What would you do? I mean, I, let, let's take it back a bit. Let's say I don't quite have full authoritarian rights, but let's say I can guide the, science, the medical profession. I like this you one. would, so you'd go back and you'd say all the nutrition research that is epidemiological gets thrown in because it, it can't prove causation. It can only prove correlation. Most of it, most all of it is based on the fundamentally flawed food frequency questionnaire. Um, actually, just as an aside, how many grams of salt did you have yesterday? I don't know, but it would have been two or three grams at least. And I know that because I was drinking salted water. <laughs> you, you, eat, you eat eggs regularly? I do eat a lot of eggs, yeah. Excellent. So uh, how many eggs did you have in the last year? 10,000. <laughs> I have no... So, I mean, these food frequency questionnaires, yeah. they'll go through. They might have a list of 200 foods. They'll ask you to, you know, quantities, amounts, all of that. And, you know... It, it's just ridiculous, obviously. I mean, most people struggle to remember what they had for breakfast yesterday, let alone a food frequency questionnaire of their dietary habits for studies that might go for four years or something ridiculous like that. So just, so just to interject, just interject for the listener. So these are the studies that have, we've been relied upon to help us formulate the food pyramid and the, the eating habits that we've developed over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Is that right? Essentially, most of the nutrition research that has been done is fundamentally flawed and needs to be thrown out. It's called epidemiology. Um, epidemiology means uh, considered guesswork. Um, it, it, it can never prove that something causes something else. What it does is it shows that there's an association. You can give you a very, very good indication that something might be connected, for instance, smoking, um, you know, smoking increases lung cancer, um, something in the order of 20 times. So if you have a look at the statistical data for that, that's very strong. But rather than a 2000% increase, a lot of the um, associations with diet that we're trying to make are in the order of maybe, uh, you know, literally a few percent, they're absolutely tiny. And these studies, the research like this is just not able to draw the conclusions that they've drawn. And then further to that, we've had deliberate misrepresentation of the science by people who uh, I would argue probably have uh, been more than a little negligent in that. So I'll give you an example. So there was a Minnesota coronary survey run in the late 60s, early 70s, had 9,000 patients, so all institutionalized, um, which meant that they were getting fed exactly what the researchers knew. They were, they were all living in institutions or, you know, aged care homes or wherever they were. And um, it was actually a, a, a blinded study, um, randomized study, and they actually replaced saturated fat in some of their diets with polyunsaturated oils. Now, the results after the study was finished, there was no publication for 16 years. And when the publications were finally um, you know, completed, they didn't actually provide information on mortality data, you know, which is what you really want to know, are people living longer? They, they had all these surrogate measures, which as you know, you can always fluff a surrogate measure. So these, um, they, they sort of went to one of the researchers and they said, well, you know, before he died, he's now deceased. And they said, why didn't you uh, publish earlier? Why did it take 16 years? And he said, well, 
we didn't like the results we got. So what does that mean? It's like, well, we had a hypothesis, we tested the hypothesis, and the findings didn't support our hypothesis. So we thought it was better to continue to mislead the public rather than actually uh, be open to the fact that we may have got it wrong. And th this is absolutely true. This is on the public record. So, but still, I said the mortality data wasn't published. So there was this guy called Chris Ramsden and he had to literally, um, he played a bit of sleuthing. He found where the original documents were in some basement. So they were on nine inch magnetic tapes and on old punch cards. So he had to get the help of a computer department who had to find all these old things that could actually read the magnetic tapes. They found some of the investigators who were still alive to go through the data and make sure it all tracked up and they weren't misinterpreting it. And then, well, good. So what did they find? They said, oh, well, if we give you saturated fats, uh, if we give you seed oils instead of saturated fat, your cholesterol goes down. Excellent. What else did they find? Oh, you also die more. Oh, <laughs> not so good. So we, in Australia, Sydney Diet Heart Study, um, I think it was 66 to 73 or something like that. So men had had a heart attack. They said, okay, we're going to, some of you guys, we're going to take saturated fat out of your diet and give you some seed oil. Fantastic. Um, so what did they find? You know, so they didn't publish, by the way, they, these, these results sort of, you know, um, again, the mortality data wasn't published until uh, 2013, I think it was finally published. Chris Ramsden, again, nine inch magnetic tapes found in a basement, literally identical. Um, they found that if you replaced some saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, the mortality increased by 62%. The risk of uh, death by heart attack increased by 70%. Um, again, this data was not published until 2013. Why? This was absolute misrepresentation. This was large scale experimental study that should have informed public opinion about the safety of saturated fats. Uh, and then there's a lot of talk about, oh, but you know, there was trans fats that was complicating and all that. Well, the, the authors of the review um, in 2013 actually went through the data and looked at trans fats. And what did they find? There was no difference between trans fats in the two groups. And here's another bombshell, by the way. I went looking for evidence that trans fats were actually deleterious the other day. Um, and I'll have to say it's tenuous at best. This is one of the things that we've swallowed hook, line and sinker. This, uh, this belief that trans fats are killing us and we take them out of the food supply and we'll all be better off. Incredibly weak evidence. And I challenge anybody to go up and show me some experimental evidence that um, conclusively shows it. Um, it's just not there. But, uh, and we can come back to that in a wee bit if you want, but you know, this kind of scientific skullduggery, you know, misconduct is not limited to this era in the 60s, 70s. This is still going on 2000. So um, Women's Health Initiative, world's biggest and most expensive diet study, 700 million US dollars, 48,000 females, you know, randomized, reduced fat diet for about eight years on average. If you read the conclusion, what did they find? Nothing. Watch the press conferences. What did they find? Nothing. No effect. No, no benefit was seen in reducing the saturated fat. However, there was one statistically significant finding of the study, but it wasn't in the results table, wasn't in the conclusion, and it was never mentioned in the press conference, and it never entered the scientific discourse. It was on page 661 of the journal in which it was published, and it was a an obscure sentence, you know, somewhat out of context that if you weren't, didn't have your radar on it, you would not know what it meant. And I've actually shown it to several doctors and they've just looked at it blankly. You know, what does that mean? What was the finding that was buried on page 661? Well, those females with pre-existing heart disease, if they were unfortunate enough to be randomized to the low fat group, the low fat group, they had a 26% increased risk of events like heart attacks. World's most expensive, biggest diet study ever found clear evidence of the harm in reducing fat in the diet. And it was just, it was obscured from public view. It was a complete and utter misrepresentation by omission of the science. So, you know, if I had, if I was omnipotent in terms of controlling medical research, I would say, 
well, we have to just do proper research. The research can be done. In actual fact, the research has been done and we know what the answers are. And we really need to throw out this you know, horrible trove of epidemiological research and actually have a look at what the actual science shows. We have to get these kind of, this mentality of here's my hypothesis, I'm gonna prove it. And if it doesn't stack up, then I'm, uh, I'm just gonna misrepresent it. And nobody is immune to this. Um, even Tim Noakes, he is now humble enough to turn around and admit he was wrong, but he still suffered these same cognitive biases when he was doing research and he, he freely admits it. He actually um, misinterpreted some of the findings of his previous research on carbohydrates in athletes on the basis of his strong beliefs at the time. As you, he wrote this very famous book, The Law of Running, which was, uh, had a, a chapter in there strongly advocating for uh, high carbohydrate diets. And he has now famously been on video tearing out that chapter in his book and saying, guys, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, not everybody has as much insight as Professor Tim Noakes and not everybody is as humble to admit that they are wrong. And I find it really baffling when people criticize him for changing his mind. Um, you know what? I, I wish everybody could change their mind and admit it when they were wrong. The world would be a much better place. It wouldn't it? it just, it's the most extraordinary thing. And, you know, we're, we're blessed to have Tim Noakes, Professor Tim Noakes coming on the show and Peter, Professor Peter Bruckner, as you mentioned. And I think this is one of the things that really attracts me to these, 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 great minds because they are humble enough and just honest enough with themselves and with everyone else around them to say, you know what, we made a mistake. We're not so dogmatic in our approach. You know, just cause I learned this for 12 years at medical school, doesn't mean it's, it's gospel. You know, we can get it wrong. The challenge I think Paul is that for someone listening to, to this, you know, this, this seems to be like a bombardment of like, you know, veganism, vegetarian, like, where do you steer someone that's that's overwhelmed with all of this information? To the science. And I, so this is what I say. So I, I, I don't want to ever get involved in any stand-up arguments with any other doctors. And my patients will come to me and they'll say, oh, I got told this, you know, by another doctor. I'll say, okay, well, that's fine. I say, well, here's what I'm saying and here's the evidence for it. You go and ask your other doctor to show you the evidence of, to substantiate their perspective. And then when you've got those papers there, you know, then you can make your own decision. But you know what? I've had a couple of patients actually go to their other doctors there. They never stump up the research. They never stump up the papers. Or if they do stump up the paper, it's not an original paper it's uh, usually a guideline that you know is just repeating bad science they never have good quality original research behind them and that's the fascinating thing i think if uh if people were more scientifically literate um which they are becoming more scientifically literate and two if doctors were more receptive unfortunately there's still an attitude of condescension by a lot of doctors I mean, you, you would have seen, um, you know, you go to your doctor sometimes, you've got this mug, don't confuse your Google search for my medical degree kind of thing. And in a degree, sure, that's a bit funny and yeah, ha, ha, ha. But it is very condescending because I find a lot of patients will come in incredibly well educated about their condition. They might have a very rare condition. It might be one in 200,000. I've, I've learned three sentences on it in med school. I'll say, tell, tell me about it. Teach me about it. Give me five minutes, let me learn about it. Um, so I think that, you know, doctors' inability, and I, I'm, I'm broadly generalising there, but, and it's a certain demographic, um, in particular, certain age of doctor, and dare I say, often a male doctor, um, who is really condescending and resistant to having any ideas, uh, any of their wisdom questioned by a patient, which I, I think is really sad because I've actually, I've learned some incredible things off patients. I mean, my, uh, I'm not, I did a lecture on something called lectins a couple of years ago 
um, which I never thought I would have uh, done a lecture on. It was, um, it was really um, science fiction to me at the time. Um, it's not that you were standing behind a lectin, you were talking about lectins. Lectins, L-E-C-T-I-N-S. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a really weird thing, which... Um, What's a lectin? Uh, What's a lectin, Dr. Paul? Ugh, that's a... Yes. <laughs> Should so we we'll say that for another podcast? Uh, we'll say, I mean, carbohydrate binding protein that can trigger autoimmune disease. But the point here is I learned about lectins because patients come in and said, oh, what do you know about this? Have you read this? Have you read that? And I'm like, actually, no, I haven't. Um, but, you know, you can... Sometimes patients come in and they're just talking trash. Yeah, there's this like, you know, that has no biological basis at all. That's just rubbish. Yeah. It. But sometimes, you know, I say something and I say, well, you know, I don't know. And my first instinct is to say, ah, it's rubbish. But quite often I have to say, you know what? I actually don't know. It's much, when you say I don't know, it then allows you to say, I'm going to go and learn about that. I'm going to go and read that. And it might be for every 10 I don't knows, there's only one thing that actually turns out to be useful but by god sometimes it can be so useful so i mean this learning about lectins for me has really opened up a whole new avenue of medicine it's really it's uh opened my eyes and given me the capacity to treat this whole um cache of patients cache of patients who were previously i couldn't help because i had no concept of how I could possibly help autoimmune disease besides medications with horrible side effects or beyond the whole usual approach of, uh, you know, can't see it, not there, it's not good. Because a lot of patients will have autoimmune disease and they won't have been tested. And they'll say to me, well, why didn't my other, my usual doctor test for this? And I say, well, you know, up until three years ago, I don't know that I would have tested for it, not because I couldn't test for it, but because we didn't have any treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And if, and we're routinely taught, and quite logically, if a test is not going to change management, don't do the test. So if you don't have a test for something, why would you test for it? If you don't have a treatment, why would you test for it? Um, but now I have a treatment, and that's very empowering as a doctor. Well, if I can share something with you, Paul, because it, what you were speaking about earlier is so close to home for me, because for 17 years, I had uh, diagnosed good gastrointestinal reflux disorder that I was told by 20 different, different uh, GPs over the course of the 17 years. To, Cause I had to go back and get repeat prescriptions. I had two endoscopies done and I had two surgeons check me out as well. And every single one of them said that I had a genetic disorder and it was incurable. There's nothing I could do about it. And I watched one podcast with Chris Cresser, the functional medicine guy on Joe Rogan back in 2016 and I'd quit drinking at that point. It'll be four years off the drink in next month. And I think I'd been off the drink for about four or five months. And then I learned about this gluten intolerance. And I went, oh, I wonder if that's me. And I cut out the, all the refined uh, bread and pasta and stuff. And I got a DEXA scan done. And I lost three and a half grams, uh, three and a half kilograms of visceral fat around my organs in three months just from cutting out bread and my heartburn went away and it was never to return. And as a 36 year old male at that point, who was still um, relatively active and I was playing cricket for the last two years before I gave up the gluten, I was breaking down doing facet joint injuries, mild hamstring tears, calf strains, like really innocuous injuries that I'd never really suffered from my whole life. And only up until recently, I haven't been injured from that kind of damage at all. And it just boggles my mind that all these medical professionals had no clue about how to help me. Thousands of... Well, it's even of worse than that. So I'm on some Facebook groups and one of them is a, a medical doctor Facebook group. There's several thousand doctors and it's just fun to, you know, people put up pictures of rashes and say, what is this? And yeah, actually it can be a bit educational. But... Um, <laughs> There was a, a lady um, was wondering, she was uh, pregnant and she was just wanting some advice on, you know, she was a doctor herself about what she should do with her reflux in pregnancy. And everybody's she's saying, oh, is it safe to take these drugs, the proton pump inhibitors? And the general consensus was, oh, yes, they're recognised as safe in pregnancy. You absolutely should do that, rah, rah, rah. And 
me being the contrary and I am, I said, but you know, but they're not entirely benign. You know, they are associated with B12 deficiency, you know, increased risk of, uh, you know, community acquired pneumonia, gut issues, magnesium deficiency, you know, calcium. iron deficiency, yeah. um, you know, impaired bone health. So, you know, they're not entirely benign. And I said, and given that they're not entirely benign, you know, have you thought about dietary change? And poo poo that said, so, oh, you know, how would that possibly work? There's no evidence for that. And I said, okay, here's the papers. There is evidence, there's research evidence. So first paper by uh, Eric Westman. So they actually did esophageal probes where they stuck a, um, a probe down the esophagus and they measured the acid levels um, down at the uh, end of the esophagus before it entered the stomach and how much acid was rising up. And they found they could get a massive reduction in six days on a low carb diet. Pretty impressive. Esophageal probes, you know, direct measurement of acid levels, you know, that, that should be pretty convincing. No, nah. you know, couldn't possibly work. I said, well, okay, we've got mechanistic evidence too. So they've actually shown that these, you know, mythical lectins, which I described before, they can actually stimulate something called IgE that's bound to something called a mast cell which is basically the mechanism that releases histamine that can increase acid secretion. So they've actually shown that these, um, you know, ingesting these lectins, which gluten is a type of lectin, wheat germ gluten is another one, um, concavalin, and, and there's, you know, there's basically plant-based grains stuff. They're very rich in them. They, they showed the mechanism of how ingesting these substances could clearly cause an increase in uh, acid and contribute to reflux. Yep, weren't interested. The, the consensus was, even though I had mechanistic evidence clearly laid out in the physiological literature, you could read that in textbooks or you know scientific papers. I had experimental evidence. The studies have been published using esophageal pH probes, proving that you could reduce the acid secretion. No, it's just it, it, you know you don't want to do something extreme like cutting out grains. It's much safer to just take a proton pump inhibitor because you know they're they're probably safe-ish in pregnancy. And that was the medical opinion. And I, I could not argue it with science. Um, and there, there's, uh, you can't win that kind of argument because there's no logic used in that argument. And if I, as a doctor, can't convince other doctors when I've got evidence firmly on my side, well, what hope on God's green earth does the average patient have? One thing I forgot to tell you, Paul, which is very important, the follow-up DEXA scans that I got I put on half a kilo of skeletal bone density in a year and I wasn't doing much in the way of weightlifting. I was a runner. I started okay, doing Okay, so get running. this. So did you know that we have randomized control trial level of evidence that osteoporosis can be reversed with nutritional intervention in, get this, postmenopausal females and men over the age of 60? They've got randomized control trial level of evidence of that. And... Do you know what the standard of care for osteoporosis is? Bisphosphonate medication, horrible side effects. Um, there's a couple of other things that generally don't work. We have proven nutritional intervention and we don't do it. And part of it is 40% um, of the dry weight of bone is protein. So if you're trying to build bone, would it not be logical that you would need a high protein diet? You, yeah, you know, just logically. So, yeah, because because what we've done is we used to give people calcium and vitamin D to increase calcium absorption because we know there's a lot of calcium in bone. But that's like trying to bake a cake with only one ingredient. You need all the ingredients. So if you give somebody a lot of calcium, that will reduce their need to break down bone to release calcium because bone is where the body will is calcium is stored. So if you short on calcium in your diet, your body will just break down bone to get some, that's fine. So you can reduce down the degradation of bone or the loss of bone mineral density by giving somebody calcium. But how are you going to rebuild it if you don't have the protein there, which is the, the scaffolding structure in which all these minerals are placed? So, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. So in this study, they actually gave people a calcium and, vi a, yeah, calcium and vitamin D supplement and then they looked at them, they monitored them with DEXA scanning over a three year period every six months to see what would happen. And they found, and they didn't find much, so then they did something smart. They stratified their results by protein intake. And they found that the people in the highest tertile 
of protein intake actually reversed their osteoporosis. This is postmenopausal females we're talking about, the population. So what you did, yeah, I'm not, not discrediting that, but you've got nothing on grandma. You know, if she can do it, and I, I get sick. I, this really annoys me because I see a lot of people come in and they're taking these bisphosphonate medications, which are basically, once you put them in the body, you've got it for life. We're always worried about giving it to females um, if they're going to have more children because we don't know if they're going to be teratogenic. God um, damn. I've seen them in athletes. The way they work is they inhibit bone turnover, but they don't make the bone healthier. They, they affect the their connections within the bone, the interconnectedness. And they actually lead to a lot of stress fractures in athletes. I've seen some athletes have career ending fractures because of this bisphosphonate medication. They're a terrible drug. And we've got nutrition that can be done easy uh, that, that, that will replace it. And so, you know, your experience talks to the truth and we I've don't got, do that. I've got one more example. It's anecdotal only, but another guest of the show, Diane McGrath, the Mars One astronaut candidate is a 50 year old female and she has been experimenting with a carnivore diet as in just all meat or all animal protein to try and put on bone density because the seven months in space that it takes to get to Mars is the equivalent of going through menopause with, in terms of the associated bone density loss. And mm -hmm. through DEXA scans, I heard this from her mouth and maybe she should be someone that you uh, have on a show together or you come on this one together and talk about this. She's put on, about 250 to 300 grams in, in about a period of six months, I think. And combined yeah. with some weight training, perimenopausal. Well, it's, it's totally predictable. I mean, so we used to get taught and it, when I say we used to get taught, it is current teaching that once you're 20 or 30 years old, your bone mineral density peaks and it is never recoverable from then. And this is just blatantly false. Um, so, I mean, and this should be very reassuring for the uh, the Mars mission astronauts to know that even if they do lose bone mineral density, which they almost certainly will, then it is recoverable. The only trouble is there's no cows on Mars. So they're going to have to 3D print all their meat and Christ knows what the associated side effects of that will be. But that's for another podcast, I think. Yeah. I mean, well, they're, they're only going to recover once they get back to earth. Well, it's, it's, one, presuming way. it's one way. Yeah, that's I was presuming they back. end up with a, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Paul, I'm, I, I could talk about this all day and all night with you. You are a fascinating individual. What I, what I think we should do is maybe bring this to a conclusion because for anyone that's interested in learning more about this, Paul has a, uh, and a wonderful array of very interesting, well thought out, very well researched and very credible information that you can watch uh, on YouTube. Very active member of Low Carb Down Under and involved with all of the other great minds that we were talking about as well with Professor Tim Noakes and Professor Peter Bruckner and Pete Jacobs we had on the show and Jamie L. Jacobs, who I know he was a patient of yours. He mentioned, spoke very, very highly of you as well. Um, so there's some really good stuff coming out of this, Dr. Paul. Do you want to finish on anything in particular before we go? Look, I, don't, I, I have so many pedestals and so many soapboxes. I, I sometimes don't know which one to step up onto. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I just tell people, do your own research. And uh, this might sound a little bit um, demeaning to the medical profession, but don't trust doctors. They, they they're intelligent people. They have capacity to remember facts, but often that's, uh, that's not reflected in their ability to critically appraise the literature and to, to think um, in a rational fashion. Um, they often, because what we learn in medical school is just so, so in, intense. There's so much volume. And it's uh, unfortunately, in terms of trying to cram all that information in, there's a, uh, we sort of lose the ability to pass some of the information and to sort out the, the good stuff from the bad stuff. And it's often said that 50% of what we learn in medical school is wrong. And the, the trouble is we don't know which 50%. I'd even say the problem is worse than that. And I'd say that unfortunately, 
the 50% uh, that we do use happens to be the wrong 50%. Um, so, you know, um, there, there's a lot to be said for people um, educating themselves. This is going to be a grassroots revolution in terms of nutrition. Um, there's really doesn't appear to be sufficient appetite for leadership in the political forum. And there's certainly a lot of opposing headwinds um, coming from uh, outside influential forces in terms of government policy. So you can't look at the government, you can't look at guidelines, you can't look at uh, the food labelling system to save you from this one. You have to take personal responsibility and figure it out for yourself. And that's really unfortunate. Um, but if you do that, then you may be, you know, you may take yourself back 200 years. Be, be in the situation where centenarians were 80 times more common um, than they are now, which is just bizarre when you think about it. Why should that be? Um, and there's no reason for it. Um, take yourself back to a healthy lifestyle, forego, um, you know, forget about all this franken food that we're having now. Um, exercise regularly, sleep well, you know, take yourself back to a, um, a more evolutionarily appropriate lifestyle. Paul, this has been really extraordinary and we thank you so much for your time. Where can we find you if we need to look for you, apart from what I just said? Uh, look, I've got a Twitter handle, Dr. Paul Mason. Um, that's the same as my YouTube channel, Dr. Paul Mason, DR Paul Mason. Uh, they're probably the two main places that I'm active. I do have an Instagram account. Um, I'm yet to make a post. So that's probably going to be unfulfilling <laughs> if you uh, follow me there. But, but follow me anyway. You know, it might stimulate me to, uh, to uh, throw something up there one day. Well, I think maybe we should have you back on the show in another time in the future to just to, to follow on from some of this really amazing information. Um, do you do telemedicine in your practice from because you're in Sydney at the moment? Uh, I do actually, yeah. So this whole uh, COVID thing sort of stimulated that and uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, so absolutely, if you go to my Twitter page, um, I'll just have to make sure the details for how to do that are up there. If I think it's there, like, I better... it's like a booking system. I think you can just click on. Yeah, th there is an online booking system that uh, that can be clicked on. So uh, it's just got a, uh, a web link there. So I'm very happy to do teleconsults. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paul Mason. Thank you, Laban. <laughs>